You may have been worried, not knowing where to turn. The faith you thought you had had, turned to doubt and fear. We bring you this great hope we found, hanging on a His name is Jesus, Messiah, he is still the King of Kings. His name is Jesus, Messiah, he is still the Lord of Lords. Oh, take him in, he'll change your life, give you peace inside. say amen. amen. It is truly an honor when David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He didn't need to know who the preacher was, 
but he knew that there are some things that happen in God's house that never happens in your dorm room or your own house. So I'm so glad to be in this house here tonight. Thank you, Solos, for that wonderful rendition of song. And I want to thank the young man who prayed. Thank you for the prayer, sir. And I want to thank the Lord for the woman of God who read the text. I truly do believe, I want to talk to theology students, you're all here, so you're going to get some, some lectures for free. Whenever you become a preacher, don't you ever think you're better than anybody else. Whenever you become a preacher, don't let your title be greater than your towel. Having a title does not mean anything. It's who you are and how you make people feel. And whenever you're in ministry, there's nobody who is better because of a title. God has more pastors because pastoring is a gift. Being in the office of pastor does not make you better than all with the gift of pastor. There are church members who are in touch with God more than pastors. But I'm telling you now, I wish somebody had told me. So don't get the title whilst you're still a student of being a pastor. You haven't earned it yet. Stay humble. This is from a senior guy to you. It's for free. Because the moment you drink from the cup of pastor, you block all your learning skills. There are more pastors who teach one thing and they never listen to anybody else because of title. And that's why I'm modeling this today, that everybody who did something on this pulpit was chosen by God to be minister. And the same thing with all of you. Whenever God puts his finger on you, ask you to sing a song, ask you to be a deacon, ask you to clean the church, you are as important as the person in the pulpit. It's not what we do, it's whose we do it for who brings value on what we do. I'm ready to preach here tonight. Let's talk to him. Father, the time has come and they're here now. So glad for this little talk. Some may be mad and I'm glad about it. I pray that, Lord, your spirit may come and abide with us tonight. And I pray that, Lord, he may be lifted up. You said when you are lifted up, you are the one who does the drawing. So help me tonight, God, to lift you up, pump you up, and take you to the heights so that you may do that which humanity cannot do for themselves. Come close to God. I pray that, Lord, the potency of this word may be experienced here tonight and may yokes be broken. And, God, I pray that them chains may fall tonight because you have come to set your people free. May you empower, may you deliver, and may you truly show us who we are and give us a greater concept of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen again. As I was looking in, in this text and wrestling with uh, this text found in the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is a very powerful book. It's got six chapters in there, and it is one of those, if you want the gospel in a synopsis or in a summary kind of form, the book of Ephesians is one of those books. If you are a true theologian, the book of Ephesians must become a book that you visit to on a weekly basis. Because the book of Ephesians has the themes about Christ and God that are so powerful that you can only find them in there. And, and it is one of the books where people try to grab some little bit of stuff and, and run away. Read the whole book. It's a letter. Is that what everybody? Which means Paul didn't write one passage and went to sleep and came back one week later. No, he sat down and, and wrote the letter. It is important now, whenever you read the Bible of God, that when you come to the letters, read them like letters. 
If, if you find time, if you want the book of Romans, it's a letter. So start from one all the way to the end. You'll be amazed at how it is packaged together. The book of Corinthians, it's a letter. So read it all in one sitting. Don't take one verse and try to mess around with it. That's what theology does. It messes us up. You take one verse, try to pacify it and try to divide it. And yet it is in a context and family. So we end up getting the kudos from our friends and they shout up because you've got a little bit of something and yet you miss the message. And whenever you come to the Bible, oh, I feel it. Whenever you come to the Bible, you need to know the reason why the author gave the book. And when you read the book, the author will always reveal to you why he wrote the book. For example, you look at the story of Jonah. Many preachers have preached from Jonah and Everybody talks about him running and talk about him being in the belly of the fish and talk about him preaching 40 words and everything happened up. Hey, look here, that's good. But that's not the reason why the book of Jonah was written. If you do not get to chapter 4, you'll never know why Jonah ran. You'll never know why Jonah got in the fish. You'll never know why Jonah had to preach mad, stinking like fish. It is in chapter 4 where Jonah says, I ran because you love people. If you were to read the first, second, third book of John, you'll discover that the reason why he wrote the book, he actually tells you the reason in 1 John 5, 12. If you were to read the book of John, you'll be mesmerized by the wine turned into water, Nicodemus being told about water, the woman at the well being told about water, my boy at the pool of Bethesda being healed from water. You go on this water everywhere in the book of John, but John will let you know the reason I wrote the book, it's actually in the last chapter of the book. That you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here's the deal. Never read the Bible when you are lazy and you don't have time. So that's what separates great preachers from average preachers. Not every preacher is preaching at their maximum level because most preachers are lazy. Preacher, why do you say that? I'll say this to you. I've been preaching for 27 years now, and here it is. I've never repeated a sermon. The word of God is so potent and so sweet to me that I cannot repeat it. If you hear it once, I ain't going to give it to you again. So theology students, don't try to go to that chapter, what do you call it, the file 13, where your sermons are all yellow because you've been preaching them over and over again. So that's what separates preachers. People wonder, what is it that moves people when you preach? Well, it's the freshness of the word. The Bible is so thick that you have no time. If you don't have new sermons, then you better quit. With this YouTube and Facebook, some of us have no luxury to repeat a sermon because somebody has ever has heard about it before I got in. So let me preach here today. I, I've got a, I'm feeling some fire tonight. And I'm just going to let it come on you. Is that all right? And theology students, take notes. Because nobody, I haven't been told I'm going to meet with you, so I'm as well just hit you. Don't, don't feel bad. You, I just want you to be better than me. Don't feel bad. We want great theologians from Africa. And we want greater preachers than Doug Bachelor. And the vision you have of yourself always produces the impact of your ministry. What's your vision of you? See, if you just want to be a pastor of 10 churches in the village, and then you marry a village girl, and then all you do is just give rules to people, when you die, nobody remembers that you ever lived. But when your vision is tight and potent and you trust God with it, he will take you places that you have never imagined you could go. And so please, don't feel offended. I'm here to inspire that's my job, and that's why he brought me this far. When you look in Scripture, there are some moments in the Bible that really gets me moving, and I choose to call them God moments. You remember the widow of Seraphath when she was about to die? Anybody remembers that? 
she was going to eat the last meal and then die. And then a but God moment happened when Elijah was sitting at the gate of the city. And when she told him, we just need to eat a little bit and die, Elijah changed her whole story. What about the woman who was caught in the very act? Anybody remember, sir? She was caught in the very act. We dress up to come to church. She was undressed so that she could be brought to church. What do you do when the evidence of what you were doing is on you and you are brought into the face of Jesus the Christ? Everybody who is sitting here tonight had to appear and act holy in order for us to come. But my girl was dragged from the bed. She had no time to dress and freshen herself. The evidence of adultery was all over her. And when they brought her to church, she had got how it's amazing how people can have guts to bring a sinner to church and to Jesus' class. Had it not been for Jesus who got up and knelt down and wrought in the ground and the rest of the story became a different story because God gave her a God moment. And even the woman at the well, when she came at the wrong time, noon was not right time, but it was the divine time for her. God has this thing of pulling people to himself. You are so important to God that God is willing to get everybody out of the room so that you and God can have an audience. You read that chapter, it lets you know that all the 12 boys that Jesus had, the Bible says they all went away to buy bread. Now, that is ridiculous because how can 12 people go buy bread for one person? Well, you think deeper about it. Well, God wanted to dismiss them, gave them something to do whilst he waited for her to come. And the Bible says Jesus now is set on the well. It, it does not say he's set by the well. He's set at the well. He's set on the well. That's what the Greek says. In other words, it was not alongside. It was not near the well, but Jesus set on the well, which meant if when she came in, she had to deal with him because he was sitting on the well. If he was by the well, she could have ignored him. If he was sitting at the well, she could have ignored him. But he was sitting on the well. And there's somebody here tonight who knows how it feels like when Jesus sits on top of that which you need the most. And all he wants is your attention. You are not going to get this before you talk to me. If you're going to get it, you're going to go through me today. It was a God moment for her because she started talking to Christ. That conversation turned into worship. That conversation turned into her becoming an immediate evangelist in the moment. Who had ever thought that a lady with so many husbands and even the one that she had that morning was not hers? Who could have ever thought that she was so theologically sound? You know, sometimes, that's why I say to my friends, the theologian, you need to understand that not everybody who looks like a prostitute don't know God. This is what Rahab tells us. You remember that? In Joshua chapter 2, when they came in, they thought they were just going to find a girl who was looking for a man, but they found an evangelist who said, we know your God. See, don't judge people on the outside because you don't know what God is doing on the inside. It was Rahab who says, look here, I know that this city is given to you. It was Rahab who interceded for your family. She said, look, when everybody else dies, Please save my family. Well, I thought she was a harlot from the city. And then I discovered she was a child of the king. In fact, she was hanging around with the army generals who were trembling and afraid. And in their fear, they were talking to her. They thought she was just a harlot. So what would she know? So they downloaded on her everything that she needed. That when she saved her family, it was not through prostitution, but it was through believing God. God moment came to Moses when he came to that burning bush. If you think about it, you may ask yourself what would have happened if he had not turned. Because the Bible says God only spoke after he turned. In other words, it implies that Moses had been seeing this burning stuff happening but they never got his attention. And on this one day, he said, wait a minute, let me do something different. 
It's not that God has been far away from you. It's not that God hasn't been answering your prayer. But how many of us know that sometimes we're just too busy to give God the attention that he deserves? But when you are tired of same old, same old, you are tired of doing the same thing over and over. When you are tired, sometimes there's a blessing called tiredness. Many of us in this place would have never been where we are had we not become tired of being ourselves. It was a God moment when the bush was burning and out of nowhere, instead of hearing the bush, then Christ himself starts talking to him and changes his destiny and changes his trajectory into something that literally delivered a nation. It was a but God moment for him. What about my boy on the cross? He had done it. Society had confirmed it. He was on that cross for what he had done. In fact, he tells you on the cross that, listen, we are here because we deserve it. But a God moment happened for him. God who is rich in mercy. Isn't it amazing that of all the people that Christ could have talked to, he talked to a thief before he died. So you say, for me, I'm no longer caught up in my titles. I tell people every time, whenever people ask me, what do you do? When I get on a plane and somebody wants to ask me, well, what do you do, sir? Here's what my answer is. I am into human development. That's what I am in. We are international. We got hospitals. We got universities. We got, look here, my company is so international. We are doing some things in big places. I am into human development. We transform people from being bad to good. We, that's what I do. Why? And I'll tell you why. Because when I am on a flight for 18 hours, I, nobody wants to be messed up sitting next to a preacher. They didn't buy their ticket for them to be messed up. Let them watch what they want to watch. It's their money. It ain't yours. And I've said this in my city. My Baba, in fact, my Baba doesn't even know I'm a pastor. He just thinks, well, I am into human development. I'm about to invite him to church. I cannot wait to see the shock of his life. We've been together for four years, and this brother does not even know I'm a preacher. Because here's the deal, if my title is the only thing that authenticates what I say, then I am a miserable individual. What happens when the title is taken away? Because it will one day, it will be over. But who I am will always be with me. And the story of God in my life will always be with me. So here it is. He was there on the cross ready to die. And then the other brother started messing up with Jesus. And then this brother had to defend Jesus. And he said, look here, man, hush your mouth. You and I, we have been thieves. We are known. We've been on the wanted list for a long time. But this brother in the middle, he is the son of God. God, don't you even have fear? In fact, let me worship him for a moment. Without a Bible study, without a war say, without a Sabbath keeping, without attending his healing sessions, without even eating the bread and the fish out of the 5,000, the man said, well, Lord, remember me. And how many times have we used that verse on holy people when it was said by an unholy person? The text says, but God who is rich in mercy. And I want to take you to one text that I want to preach on tonight, just 15 minutes when I sit down. Here it is, Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to tie all these stories together for your, for your, for your empowerment. Here it is, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. The book of uh, Romans and this chapter is a very powerful chapter. It is one of those chapters that you need to go to. Just go to it when you feel low. Go to it when you feel like your value is not what it is. Go to Romans chapter 8. I had to do a one year series with my church just on Romans 8 uh, from verse 1 to the end. We didn't even finish the chapter. See, when I say I miss my church, I miss my church. I, I have a crazy, empowered, God-loving church. It's amazing. We couldn't even finish. We didn't have time just for one chapter for the year. 
So whenever life does not add up and things are messed up and people are trying to play God, all you got to do is drink from Romans 8. It is one of the most powerful verses you discover. And from verse 1, he simply starts with, it's right. It says, now there's no more condemnation. In other words, you cannot worship God before when condemnation is on you. In other words, let's deal with the enemy of what you want. If you feel condemned, you will not accept everything that comes with God. Here it is. Let me read 28, then get out of your way. Here it is. You know the text, but we're going to just mess it up tonight. Is that all right? It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For we know that all things work together for the good, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together. And many of us, this is a, tif a, a difficult text for us to interact with when days are bad. This is one of those texts that is so powerful. If I were to choose my top five verses in scripture, this one will surely be one of them. But here's what it is when you leave life and do life. This is the most difficult text to accept. And yet, it is the most powerful text to believe in any situation. Paul says, look here, number one, you need to understand this. We know that all things work together for the good. And many of us, we may not see how anything can be good when we don't see how it's going to be good. Because we don't know how it's going to happen, many of us do not believe that it will happen. And I want you to understand there's so many stuff that I've never seen, but that I know that they're real. In other words, I know that Bill Gates is a billionaire, but I've never seen any of his money, and yet I believe he's a billionaire. In other words, I know that Dr. Cassis has a PhD, and he's a doctor, but let me tell you something, I've never seen his degree, but I believe. And I want you to understand there's so much in your life that you don't know and yet you believe. And many of us mess up when it comes to God because we want to figure God out. And I'm here to let you know that no matter how deep you get, you never figure out who God is. That's why God gives us this grace thing called belief. This grace thing called faith. Because if you try to figure him out, you will never catch up with him because he is simply God. So not knowing how God is going to do it should never stand in the path of believing that God is going to do it. The text does not say all things are good. The text does not say you are going to like everything. The text says all things work together for good. In other words, you may not like it as it appears, but God says I am committed to the final product. When it's all said and done, you're going to appreciate the goodness of God in all things. So number one, here it is. You must learn to believe God's word for yourself. You must learn to believe God's word for yourself. All things work together. Pastor, how can I prove it? Well, you can't prove it. You must learn to believe God's word for yourself. In other words, all I got is believe. If God says it, then God means it. And if God means it, it's going to be so. If it's God's will, it's always God's bill. In other words, if God is in it, then God is obligated to see me through. I believe the word of God for me. I don't need to see it. I don't need to feel it. I don't need to understand it. All I got to do is that all things work together for good. But you are crying, yes, I am. But I believe the word of God for me. All things work together for good. But you don't have school fees. Well, I believe the word of God for me. All things work together for good. How do you know? For my God shall supply my air 
all your needs in Christ Jesus. How do you know? I believe as long as my belief is alive, I can face anything and keep on ticking. You may not see how God always works to make everything so. Behind every promise of God is the providence of God. When I believe the word of God for myself, it simply means that I believe that things don't work out coincidentally. When I believe the word of God for myself, I do believe that all things don't work out accidentally. In other words, there's no coincidence in my life. There's no accidents in my life. When I believe the word of God for myself, I now believe that all things work out providentially. In other words, God has sent it before I got to it, and God has a way out of it before I ask for it. I have discovered that wherever there's a problem, there's a solution. Wherever there's a wall, there must be a gate. And all I've learned is I don't need to know where the gate is because some gates are secret gates. All I got to do is to hook up with God and God knows what else I need. I must believe the word of God for myself. And I don't know who it is that who needed this tonight who seriously have got things going on in your life and you are beginning to question God and trouble is everywhere and things are not adding up. I want you to understand, Paul says, start right where it must begin. For we know, for we what everybody? This is a knowledge thing. This is not a feeling thing. You cannot serve God with emotions. Emotions have their own place. You cannot move God with your tears. You, you, know what I'm saying? you, you can move me, but you cannot move God with tears. You cannot move God with emotions. For the Bible says without faith. So faith is the only thing that moves God. You may say your prayer with a crying voice and everybody feels moved. That does not move God. God ain't emotional. That's why when God gets to the pool of Bethesda, instead of feeling sorry for the brother 38 years over there, instead of saying, please may I, he simply say, get up and walk. How insensitive is this? Well, God says, I'm a faith God. If you can put your faith into play, then your limbs are going to be strong. I will strengthen your legs as you believe me. All things work together for good. The second thing you'll discover, brothers and sisters, is this. But because all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes, I must learn now to receive God's working for me. The text says, where is it at? It says, all things work together for what? For good. All things work together for good. In other words, it is, God is always acting in my best interest. And I must receive God's working for me. In other words, because of providence, God is behind the scenes orchestrating things. God is behind the scenes making things work out for my good. The weed of Zarephath, she just thought this was an ordinary day, not understanding that God had sent a prophet from the brook all the way to Zarephath. She didn't know that God had already worked things out so that his solution was in a person. And let me say this. This is really good. I love it. Here it is. Most of God's answers to your life will always have a human face. <laughs> See, that's why you got to love everybody. That's why you got to be nice to everyone. The students who are students today, they're going to be presidents. And if you mess them up when they're taking one-on-one, -on -one, you need them when they will bless you. I tell people this every time. You don't know who God is going to use to bless your life. It's not accident that you meet people. The weed of Zarephath, because here it is, Elijah was not even from Zarephath. In other words, they didn't even look alike. The woman at the well told Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a... Samaritan, but Samaritan girl, can you trust a Jewish man to be the solution to your trouble? 
And many of us, when we deal with people, we're here for four years on this campus. If you'd make it in four years, here's what the deal is. You are meeting with the world as you are a student at this school. You don't know what people are going to become. God, I must receive the workings of God for me. It doesn't matter how tough it is. God is working behind the scenes. I must never stop believing that no matter how it looks like, there is a God behind the scenes who is pulling everybody together. Because everything will work out together for what everybody? If I love God. Here's the other thing that is very powerful. This text is not for everybody. That's why everybody must fall in love with Jesus. This text message, this, this, this WhatsApp text is not for everybody. This one is for special people. God says all things work together for those who love God. If you don't love God, well, you are in confusion. When you love God, well, everything works out together for good. That's why I, I wonder sometimes how people can live without God. Because there are some things that, that, that don't happen for you. Did you hear what I'm saying? That there are some things that don't happen for you, but they just happen for those who belong. I love it when I travel around the world and go to nations. And one thing I've discovered that I always love, I love going back home. And I'll tell you this. And when I came here to Kenya, and one thing very amazing, there was a shorter line on one side and there was a long line on the other side. That's where I was, in the long line. You know why? Because the short line was for Kenyan citizens. And when I see that, I look forward to going home. Because believe you me, there are millions who are coming to the United States. And when I get home, I will not get in the long line. It is a wonderful thing for you to just go through the short line. And not only do I go through the short line, I'm asked, sir, how are you doing? I'm called sir for the first time. Why? Because I belong there. As it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. When you love God, there are benefits to loving God. And one of those great benefits is that all things work together for good. In other words, God, it doesn't matter where God throws the ball, we are going to score. If I love God, it doesn't matter what God does. If he chooses that I die, it's going to work together for good. If he chooses that I leave, it's going to work together for good. If I get sick, it will work together for good. That's why Paul says, in everything, give thanks. Not for everything, but in everything. you got to be in it. In order for God to take you out of it, but whilst you are in it, have a party. Uh, here it is, number three. Gotta finish this thing. <laughs> oh, I love it, 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 I love it. Number three, here it is. Learn to achieve God's will for you. Learn to achieve God's will for you. Listen to the last two words on 28. It says, now for we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. You saw that? To those who are what? Called according to his what? Those two words, his purpose. Learn to achieve God's will for you. God works everything in your life to make you become just like Jesus. When you look and you ask the question, what is God's purpose for me? Some of you may say, Pastor, I see that according to his purpose, what is God's purpose for me? Is it for me to graduate uh, uh, here from here? Is it for me to get a career that will really blow everybody's minds? Now, verse 29 has and defines what God's purpose for you is. Watch this. All things work together for good for those who love God, called according, called according to his purpose. And 29 says, for whom he foreknew, he also what? Predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. Now, let me help you here tonight. If you don't get this, you are too slow. The purpose of God is for you to look like Jesus Christ. 
So all things work together. In other words, whenever God does something in your life that blesses you, it's not for you. It's for Christ's image to be produced in you. So God makes me happy so that I may become like Christ. See, Christianity becomes shallow when it's about things. That's why God can take things anytime. Ask my boy Job. He'll let you know. I had it all figured out. I was the man on the hill. But in, in few minutes, it was all gone. My children gone. My everything gone. And Job says, well, the Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What God is trying to do with you, I know where I am. I, I'm at a university, so somebody doesn't have school fees here. Somebody's trying to pay that fees. God is more concerned about your character development than him changing your situation. I've got a young man who's coming in on Thursday. He's 29, and he is almost a billionaire. He's going to be here with us from Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He is on the 3030 Forbes Africa, 29 guy. He is going to be here, and he's coming to empower you guys. And I was talking to him this morning. I said, man, when you come, I don't want you to be the solution to everybody's problem. He said, Pastor, what does that mean? I said, well, you are almost a billionaire, and you're a young guy, which means when people see people like that, they want to get all their problems solved. At some point, learn to believe God. When you believe God, then everybody becomes a tool that God is using. You don't thank people. You thank God for people. It changes your whole life. Here's what, what, what the text says. It says, look here. God is trying to produce the image of Christ in you. So when I'm healthy, it's not for me. But it's for me to fall in love deeper with God. When the money is right, it's not for me. It's for the image of Christ to be produced in me. When I am sick, it's not for me. Didn't Jesus say even when Lazarus died, he said, look here, this death is not, this sickness is not unto what? And then he died. I mean, Jesus said this sickness is not unto death, and then he died. So Jesus says, believe me, even when it looked like it died. Because if I told you it's not unto death, then it dies, then it means I'm about to show you something. So your struggles when you love God, they are not to discourage and to throw you off. Your struggles as much as your blessings and joys when you love God, they are all chisels through which God is using to deposit the image of Christ in you. That's why when you look at it, every Christian has got mountaintop experiences and valley experience. Anybody ever notice that? Yeah, because God takes you up to the mountaintop for you to be encouraged. And then he brings you down to the valley for you to be humble. And then God takes you up. That's our lives, man. If you're on top, don't laugh at me because we're going to exchange when you're coming down. I'm going up. Listen, when you're on top, you better pray for me in the valley so that when I'm going up, I'll start lifting your name up because I, my day is coming. Because all things work together for good. That's why the Bible says, envy not. Envy not. In other words, if someone has it, there's a purpose in that. Some people can only worship God when everything is okay. Very few of us are trusted by God with trouble. Because see, when you come to Christ, in fact it is, God draws you to himself through blessings. But God matures you in him through trouble. So when all you got on your plate are blessings, everything is working out, and you are singing, all oh, things are working for my good, how oh, he's intentional, well, that's a song for those he's drawing in. For those of us who are already drawn, pain is a normal. Pain is a constant because we have learned that God is an ever-present help, not out of trouble, but in trouble. 
So I don't know who it is that God has bothered me with today for this message. To just let you know you need to achieve God's will for you. God is more important than he is. God has called, he is what it means now. It means he's more concerned about changing my character more than changing my bad situation. It means that God wants to change what happens in us more than what happens to us. Because what God wants is for us to look like Jesus. Look like who? Yeah, likeness is not sameness. In other words, there will be one Jesus for the rest of our lives. But all of us are going to look like many Jesuses. I like when I meet my father's friends. My father's been dead now for, for some years. And I like meeting my father's friends. Whenever they see me, they simply say, I know you from somewhere. And I'm saying, sir, you're too old to be my friend. And after a while, they start asking me, who is your father? And the moment I mention my daddy's name, they say, yeah, I know you look just like him. All that you're going through in your life is for the world to testify that there's somebody who looks like Jesus. All things work together for good. And the last one that I got for you, here it is. Oh, I love this. Anybody ready for this? Here it is. I love this one. It says, for we know that all. Number four to somebody who is in this place. All means all. If I was in my church right now, people would be running around the church. All means not some, not most. No, 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 no. All. All things. Isn't it funny that when Christ was in the boat and the wind started blowing and the water got in, the Bible says Christ was asleep. He was asleep in a boat that was filling up and the disciples were messed up by the problem. And when they walked Jesus, because all things work together, you notice when Christ got up, he didn't rebuke the water, Christ rebuked the wind. Because the water was the problem, but the wind was the effect. When Christ addressed the wind, the water stopped coming in. And many of us, we are worried about problems, and yet when we know that all things, what that means is Christ controls the source of your problem. And because he does when it's time, I don't need to deal with my problem. I don't have time to talk about my problem. All I got to do is to hook up with the man who can shut it down. And all means all. That's why you should not. That's why the Bible says, here's a crazy text, please. Pastor, forgive me, I'm just six minutes back. Here it is. It's really crazy. That's why the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Wow, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, make your request known unto God. You ready? With thanksgiving. In other words, thank God in it. Say, I'm looking for some Christians who love God hard enough that the devil will get mad. We have made this Christianity thing look like it's, it's a political thing. This thing is real. You cannot, you, can, God, you cannot be touched by God and remain the same way you are. And when God touches you, God makes you, oh, here it is. When God touches you, sometimes he doesn't deliver you out of it, but he delivers you in it. Because sometimes your deliverance is not situational. Your deliverance is mental. If God can deliver me from how I look at it, it is as good as God taking me out of it. But many of us have discovered when God delivers me mentally in it, I'm still as free as if I'm not in it. So here tonight, by the way, my sermon title was, Is Mercy for Bad Days. For we know that all things, Bring whatever you got, it will work out for the good. Pastor, how do you know? I don't know. And I thank God 
I don't know. I believe it'll be okay. That's why Peter had to go to sleep when he was in jail. He was on death row instead of him having a sleepless night. Peter, Ellen White says, if there was anyone among the disciples who mimicked everything that Jesus did, it was Peter. That's why when Jesus was walking on the water, Peter said, since it is you, I got a roll. I mean, I don't know how it's going to work out, but it's since it is you, just, just invite me to join you. So Peter is on death row, and Peter says, aha. Uh -huh. I remember when Jesus was asleep and we were in trouble. So I am not going to be in trouble here tonight. Since God does not sleep nor slumber, it doesn't help me any bit for me to be awake and God is awake. So let me go to sleep. And the Bible says he was there deep in sleep snoring. How do you know he was snoring? Because the Bible says when the angel got there, it had to slap him. In other words, he was not shaken. He was, go read your text. He was slapped. And when he got up, he wanted to run and the angel grabbed him and said, put on your clothes. And then he put on his clothes. He wanted to run. And the angel says, come back, put on your shoes. And when he had his put shoes on, the angel said, don't run in front of me, boy. I've got some power in this situation. All things work together. When I'm discouraged in my life, I just look for automatic doors. Whenever I'm discouraging my life, things ain't adding up, I just go to the store that has got automatic doors. In other words, as I get close to them and they open up, I'm reminded that God is still in control. There's somebody in this place who wants to say, look here. God, I want to love you more. God, I just want to love you more. I, I cannot figure out what's going on in my life. But please increase my faith that I may believe that you are still working it out for me. If that is you, I'm going to ask you to please stand as we pray. We're done. You really want to say, God, I just want to say, please increase my faith. All things work together for good. I need your mercy for my bad days. Lord, you are rich in mercies. That's what scripture says. Lord, I need your mercy on my bad day. Lord, it, it's not feeling good. But please increase my faith that I may see you through it all, that you are working it out for my good. And it's not most, but all things work out for the good. And we are praying. Father, thank you so much for this moment here tonight. We are grateful for what you have done. We are thankful for these, your sons and daughters. Lord, as they are standing in this auditorium, I know that, Lord, it is you who brought us together. Lord, I pray in a very special way. That every situation that's represented in this place, may you show us the miraculous move of the hand of God. We pray that, Lord, we believe and we know that you are a God who is full of surprises. We are praying tonight that you may surprise our faith, surprise our faith into resurrection again. I pray for that son, for that daughter of yours, who might be standing at the crossroads of their lives like the widow of Zarephath who may truly be at, the, at their wit's end like the woman at the well, who may truly be hanging on the crucible like the thief on the cross, that one who can say, God, I don't know how I'm going to come out of it. I pray that, Lord, you don't just give us a solution tonight, but I pray that you may give us the peace of God which surpasseth all understanding for us to believe and to know and to confirm and affirm that, God, you are still working it out for our good. I pray that, Lord, every tear that has been shared, every confusion that has been experienced in the name of Jesus tonight, we pray that, Lord, you may give us peace over every situation. May we see you aright. May you clear our eyes. May you open up our ears that we may see you and hear from you. And we pray that, Lord, at the end of it all, may our faith be increased tonight. I thank you. Because your credit history is perfect with me. I know what you're able to do and even beyond what I know. God, I pray that you may touch someone tonight. The world does not have to know it. The earth does not have to be shifted. But may their hearts be moved tonight. Thank you for hearing. And I thank you for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen again.